Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. Welcome to episode 84, the second very unexpected second episode for season five. This episode was super duper spur of the moment because the internet did what it does and brought Nadia from History 2114 and I together. We started following each other on Instagram. We began to nerd out and then Nadia found out about this West African warrior queen that has been purposefully hidden in history. She told me about it and the rest is history. (laughs) Uh, I love the internet, but before we dive too deep into our episode, let's take a minute to introduce our guest and co-host for the episode. Nadia, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at Herstory 2114? Hi, Taya. Thank you so much, first of all, for allowing me to be here and, you know, nerding out with me. Um, You know, like you said, weird history happens because weird people (laughs) exist at the same time. (laughs) I think we just found each other across oceans. Uh, Exactly. (laughs) Absolutely. I know, I'm so happy. (laughs) My name is J. Nadia Headley, and I do a million things, but all of those things are based on my passion to promote social enterprise. Um, I believe that we can do more good in the world if we can do well. And so I really strongly believe that in the social space, we should collaborate more and leave competition to the business space where we can still collaborate and, you know, use everything that we know in business to leverage that for the goodness of the world. Um, So, for example, someone said, oh, we have too many billionaires in the world. And I said, we don't have enough. (laughs) You know, we need more billionaires, but with the right heart. We need people who will take that money and do something good with it. Mm -hmm. So at 2114, everything we do is centered around promoting social enterprise. And while we've been doing that, we've had, you know, amazing women who are leading in nonprofits and they're leading in entrepreneurship. And we just wanted to carve out some space for them. And that's how we started our Her Story project. And so with Her Story, we have masterminds uh, where we talk about, you know, different themes that are important for us as visionary women. Our four tenants are hone your vision, amplify your voice, write the version of your story and walk in a life of victory. So that's what we do over there at Her Story by 2114. Nadia. Oh my gosh. Oh, I just love you so much. <laughs> I'm so happy that the internet brought us together. <laughs> I'm so excited to hear more about uh, Herstory 2114 at the end of the episode. So please stay tuned for that. So without further ado, yeah. let's put on our detective caps and hop mm-hmm. into our time machines and talk about this historical figure that was almost lost. Let's get to it. So our topic today arose out of a very unconventional way. So Nadia has the full story, and I will let her tell you about that. Yes. So uh, we had an event, and at this event, this lady registered to be a vendor. I'd never met her before, which was pretty cool that people were finding us and they thought that our event, which was called Black Girl Magic, they thought it was cool and wanted to work with us. And so she registered and this name pops up in the registration and I'm like, holy crap, I don't even know where to start on this name. I'm going to offend somebody. (laughs) (laughs) I really don't want to be offensive. Um, So I started tagging everything by her business name, which is Tosoko Clothing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'm just going to Go keep using that until I figure out what to do about this name. And uh, we had a chat and she's like really sweet. I mean, like she's like your favorite auntie kind of person, but your age at the same time. Right. Um, (laughs) And So we got to chatting and I was like, listen, please send me a voice note on how to pronounce your name which she did. We get onto Instagram and then she starts talking about 
the origin of her name, right? Because mm-hmm. um, I, I asked her, I'm like, it's it's a very unique name. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I had to practice how to pronounce it. Tell me yeah. about your name. And that's when she starts talking about this warrior queen from the this tribe that I had never heard about, you know, and I mean, getting into details that we'll share later, but yeah. I just sat yeah. there like so flabbergasted. I think I was mostly hurt that I had never heard about <laughs> this queen in my life before. Right, right. There's, we'll get more <laughs> into this later, but there's recently, there's been so many things about the Dahomey and the kingdom of mm-hmm. Kush, but there's so many other West African kingdoms and history and queens that we just don't know about. Mm-hmm. So yeah. after Nadia heard this story, we were talking on Instagram one day and I really wanted to do a collaboration with Nadia. And she was like, well, I have the perfect person for you. We initially started out with only having ideas for reels on Instagram. And then we just kept researching and researching and researching. And we found so much more information and was just like, you know what? Should we just make a whole episode about this? And that is why we are here. Right. Yes. <laughs> to talk about not only <laughs> the warrior queen Doombutt, but the kingdom of Walu, her sister, and the warrior women of Walu. So to get us started, let's dive into the history of the Kingdom of Walu. So I had never heard about the Kingdom of Walu. And Nadia, had you heard about it before? Nothing, no. Right? (laughs) Nothing at all. (laughs) But when we were doing our research, we definitely should have heard about these kingdoms that used to be four separate kingdoms, but then came together as one. So do you remember the names of the four separate kingdoms? Kaor, Jalof, and I want to say it's a one that starts with a B. Hold on. I'll get it for you. Baal. So in the 16th century, those four kingdoms became the one kingdom of Wallo, and they were usually ruled by a king. But as we were researching, we found out that the king was more of a puppet and the queens were the ones who were really running the show. And the names of the queens, they weren't called queens. They were called, i it's so hard for me to pronounce, Nadia, go for it. <laughs> they were called Lingares. Lingares. So the Lingares were really the ones running the show. And the really interesting thing about, well, I don't know if interesting is the right word. <laughs> the noteworthy thing mm-hmm. about about the kingdom of Wallo is that this kingdom was the first kind of like experiment kingdom for French colonization. Mm -hmm. The French came over and established the island of St. Louis. And then in order to get trade and goods into the island of St. Louis, they created a bartering system and a, um, what is it? Trade. (laughs) They created a, like, trade agreement Mm -hmm. with the kingdom of Mm Wallow. And... That's how it all began. That's how French colonization started. Yeah, because the French were late to the game, right? You know, first first the Dutch were exploring and, you know, the Dutch were, if you if you have to say, they were the least of the evils, right? And they would they would actually engage in trade. I mean, it was it was the Dutch who paid the natives a dollar to buy Manhattan Island, right? <laughs> Even if it's not fair trade, it was still trade. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and so, you know, after the Dutch started and the, the Dutch Sugar Company was like the big one at the beginning, and then um, the... The British were the ones who kind of took the system and made it what we understand the the transatlantic slave trade to be. You know, the Portuguese, yeah. they were trading pretty even keel across uh, Africa. And then, then came the British and they 
really put a lot of system into hatred. You know what I mean? Like they took hatred and made it a system. And then the French were like, wait a minute, we're left out. (laughs) We got to get to. And so they tried to get in on the action. Yeah. And it was funny how the British turned that around for different African colonies. So the the French are coming in and they're trading, but they're little, they're wild and, you know, they're a bit ruthless. Mm -hmm. And the the British Mm -hmm. come in and they say, oh, we'll protect you from the French if you sign this treaty. We know Mm -hmm. what else they did. Um, (laughs) But yeah, but it was really amazing how all these different countries came in and just started carving up, right? Different parts of Africa and especially West Africa, for sure. Mm -hmm. So in West Africa, there were all of these powerful kingdoms. We had the kingdom of Kush. We had the Wolo. And the thing about the Wolo kingdom that I think is really interesting is that these rulers, these queens, were very tough on trade regulation. They would not back down. They would not lower their tariffs, the fees that they got for transporting these goods across their land. They were very, very strict Mm -hmm. on trade. And the Kingdom of Wallo did not trade in humans. Absolutely did not. Right. They themselves had enslaved people among the Wallow, but they did not trade in humans. That is not what they did. Mm -hmm. And as the slave trade expanded, as we know that it did, France was like, hey, you either need to lower your tariffs, lower your taxes, or start giving us some people. And the kingdom of Lowe was like, nah, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm mm-mm. (laughs) <laughs> We're not doing that. We're going to start fighting you. So in the 16th century, the ruler of Wolo, who was a woman, who was the mother of the two women that we're going to talk about today. Do you remember her name, Nadia? Yes. Awo Fatim. I'll put it here in like the thing. Awo Fatim Yamar Kuri Iaye Bodhi. Okay. <laughs> yeah. She's got a <laughs> lot of name. Yeah. I remember being like, yo, mama. <laughs> well, a lot of names. That's a long name. So, back in the 16th century, Awo Fatim and the French were fighting. And when she was fighting the French, trying to get them out of Willow, trying to save her kingdom, she was fighting with a group of warrior women that are very similar to the Dahomey that are so popular right now. We've got the woman king that just came out and more people are finding out about the Dahomey. And there's a whole other group who lasted for a longer period of time than the than the Dahomey warriors called the Walu, oh, sorry, Walo warriors. So when Al Fatim fought with her warriors against the French to let them know that they were women, they took their shirts off and showed their breasts to the French that they had just defeated and kicked out of their land. And the French were like, oh my God. They're women. It's crazy. (laughs) I really love that, right? Because it was the sign of, we know how you feel about being beat by a girl. Mm. You know what I mean? We're going to let you know. Make no mistake. You were just beat by girls. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. (laughs) Correct. Sorry, not sorry. (laughs) But unfortunately, this would not be the last time for the French and the Kingdom of Lalo to fight one another. After the death of Awo Fatim, she passed the crown on to her daughter. And her daughter would once again have to fight the French colonizers. So we're going to take a real quick break to talk about today's sponsor. So like I said in our last episode, one of the reasons I took such a long break in between season four and five is because I was feeling so run down from being a teacher in the day and history content creator at night. And when I got home, I was just completely exhausted. I was totally out of energy. So to get over this, I would drink caffeine late at night and then not be able to sleep. And then I would go into this vicious caffeine cycle of not having energy, needing energy, drinking caffeine. And it was just completely unsustainable. So I made a promise to myself that I would stop drinking 
so much coffee to try to pull myself out of this cycle. But I needed something to keep my energy up, so that's why I started drinking Magic Mind. I was a little skeptical at first, but I've been drinking Magic Mind every day for two weeks now, and I have noticed a significant change in my energy levels, my focus, and I have been able to get through the day as a teacher and then come home, do all of the For the Love of History podcast things, Instagram things, and all of the other behind the scenes stuff. It's just me doing without needing to have another cup of coffee or an energy drink. One of the things that I like most about Magic Mind is the sustainability and the quality of the ingredients, one of which is matcha. And if you've been listening to For the Love of History for any amount of time, you know I live in Japan. I love Japan. I love Japanese history. And I truly do love matcha. I am a little bit addicted. (laughs) And when I was doing my research on Magic Mind, I found out that Magic Mind sources their matcha directly from a city in Kyoto, which is like the capital of matcha. I was absolutely hooked when I found this out. Matcha has so many amazing benefits like containing L-theanine, which reduces stress and contains compounds called catechins that basically extend the benefits of caffeine by slowing down your body's ability to absorb it. Basically just means that you get the benefits of caffeine without the jitters and the crash afterwards. So seeing how well it worked for me, I would really encourage you to try it if you're looking for a way to drink less caffeine while still getting some energy help. And you know how much I love when you are kind to yourself and take care of yourself. So the Magic Mind team created a super offer for me to share with you. For the next 10 days, you can get up to 56% off of your first subscription and 20% off of your one-time purchase with the code Love of history 20. You can use my link in the show notes. So scoot your cute little booty over to magicmind.com slash for the love. Thank you so much to Magic Mind for sponsoring this episode. Now let's get back to some badass women's history. If it weren't for a Wolfa team hiding her two daughters from the French, we probably would have never heard about these two women. So to begin, Dumbat is the name of the woman that Nadia met at one of her events. And that's how this whole thing got started. And unfortunately, her name has been changed so many times times, which is kind of done on, not kind of, definitely was done on purpose to hide her name from history so that she could just be wiped out completely. Yeah. I mean, we have that linguistic DJ combination and then the soft N in front of the D, Mm -hmm. you know, and then of course you have, they would have started off Berbers. You have all the mix of languages in there as well but i feel like Mm -hmm. the difference between the date and and jumbat in age is so small why do we have so much history on the date and so little Mm -hmm. on jumbat without intention exactly so from the little bit of information that we could uncover about her we knew that she inherited the throne from her mom her mom passed it down to her we know that she just like her mom fought the french in order to keep Wello a free kingdom to keep it free from the slave trade and to keep it in independent kingdom ruled by the Willow people, making money for the Willow people and keeping things fair and free for the Willow kingdom. That, that's pretty, that's, that's, that's pretty that's much, pretty it. much all we that's can find all we about, about. Yeah. Her, about you. <laughs> and her sons. Exactly. Yeah. She mm-hmm. has sons. Uh, that's it. That's all. <laughs> that's all we got. That's all we figured out after researching it in <laughs> English and in French. So <laughs> She, we know at some point she passed on the crown to her sister. And do we know the exact date on that? Crowned the 1st of October, 1846. 
It was when the date was crowned. Woo-woo! 1st of October, 1846. Yeah. Yay! Okay, so that's that's what we know. She was crowned on October 1st, 1846. And after that, Zumbach just kind of melted into history, and we don't really know what happened to her after her sister was crowned. We don't even know how she died. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. It, I feel like there's something that the French are hiding. That something happened. This is just me. I have mm. no I have no backing for this. <laughs> but other than the fact that I kind of know. I kind of know how colonizers uh, act sometimes. And when something embarrassing or against what they would like to have in history happens... It gets conveniently swept away. So that's my conspiracy theory yeah. on the whole thing. But fortunately, we have a lot more information on Ndate, who was the last ruler of the kingdom of Wallow. You know, it was. Uh, it, it's pretty interesting here because knowing that it is coming through the maternal line, um, you really do have to wonder uh, why Jumbat has been really as we like you said like systematically and intentionally erased um because it talks about her succeeding her mother and it talks about nadate succeeding her sister mm. right but we have the date that she was crowned which mm. means if we have it down to the actual day we have to know what happened to her sister somehow yeah you know because they were they were fighting the french on one side and they were fighting the moors on another side, they were fighting against extreme um, Islamic thought of at their time, right? F- particularly from a Senegalese group. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it kind of makes you wonder from all the different directions why it is that this one queen has been taken away from us like this. It, it really makes you want to go search some more and start digging up a few more things, right? And it seems like there's more oral history. Well, there was more oral history Mm -hmm. about Doombutt than there was about Ndate. More things are written down about Ndate than I think they were about Doombutt. Well, not I think. I definitely know because we don't have any of that written information. So it seems that the oral traditions were intentionally Mm -hmm. snuffed out. Fortunately don't know which makes me absolutely (laughs) banana sandwich and i do not like it so we let's move on to date her sister and we have so much more information about her which i'm really excited to get into so we know that she was crowned on october 1st 18 what 1846. 1846. 46. And that was until 1855. Okay. When the French officially colonized Senegal. Yes. So before the official colonization, the war between the Wallow Empire and the French really got turned up a notch. So Ndate originally was going to get the more the more people to help her fight against the French. That was her initial plan because she thought, hey, if you and I get together, these two kingdoms get together, we'll be able to fight off the French more easily because the French were like, hey, listen, you need to either lower your tariffs for trade because it's costing us a lot of money to go through your kingdom to get to the island of St. Louis. We don't want to do this anymore. All of the other colonizers are laughing at us. And also, you need to start selling us human beings uh, (laughs) because we need that in our life right now. And Ndate was like, absolutely not. We're not having this. I'm keeping my kingdom safe. I'm keeping my people safe. Moors, do you want to do this with us? And initially the Moors were like, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's, yes, let's do that. Mm -hmm. But then the French were like, hey, (laughs) you can team up with us. We've got guns and stuff. And if you fight against the Wallow people, 
will give you some things. Like you guys can have money and land and all that other stuff. And like we we will still colonize you, but just not as bad as everybody else. <laughs> and so <laughs> the Moors were like, all right, cool. So they double crossed the kingdom of Willow. We're like, sorry, not sorry, guys. We got to fight against you. And, and Thanks, Dante, guys. Yeah. Thanks, dude. <laughs> right? I know. And Dante was like, WTF? What are you guys doing? So they had this vicious battle. The Wallow warrior women were fighting against the Moor and the French. And it was all just coming to a head. And finally, in the end, Dante had to surrender. And I have this quote that she said, because mm-hmm. this is written down. Of course, her surrender quote is written down, but right. you know, I know. So annoying. Yeah, of course. You're right. Yeah, of course, her surrender quote is there. <sighs> okay. Of course, the French wrote it down too, right? right? Of the French. <laughs> yeah, they wrote it down. So basically, this was in one of the conversations that she had with the French before the surrender. So she said, we have wronged no one because the country belongs to us and we must govern it. It is we who guarantee the passage of livestock in our country. For this reason, we will take a tenth and will never accept otherwise. St. Louis belongs to the governor. Kayor to the Damal and Wallow to the Brock, the Wallow leader. Each of these leaders governs his country as he sees fit. This is what she said at one of the negotiations right before the surrender of Wallow. So she was basically like, guys, this is our country. This is our kingdom. If you were dealing with another kingdom yeah. in Europe, you would have been like, yeah, 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 it's fine. This is your kingdom. We'll, we'll, you know, work with you. But instead, because yeah. this is a kingdom in Africa, they were like, sorry, we're just going to take you over. Yeah. Like no kind of respect for, you know, sovereignty, right? And of course, when you're you're trading with somebody that you don't even consider to be a person, you know, you can do things like that. And the, the sisters, they stood up and they spoke out. And, you know, there's always that confusion, or I should say debate is probably better around, okay, so what was actually in the best interest of the people at the time? Mm. Was it better to stand up and be gunned down and erased from history like Jumbat? Yeah. Or would it have been better to to create a treaty and to, you know, cuddle up in bed and at least be able to save your country? You know, it's it's quite a debate. Yeah. And it's really interesting that you say that because Ndate herself had that same question. Because once again, we have a quote written by her. I believe this was on the day of the surrender or during conversations with the French about the Kingdom of Wallow's surrender. And this this is a direct quote of what Ndate said. Today we are invaded by the conquerors. Our army is completely routed. The Tiedo, which is the Wallow army of Wallow, valiant warriors though they are, have almost all fallen to the bullet of the enemy. The invader is stronger than we are, I know. But should we abandon Wallow to the hands of foreigners? Exact same question. She didn't know. Would it be better to surrender or continue to fight? Yeah. And when I saw that quote, it feels like every feeling that Black people have, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, even now, what's happening in the U.S., right? In, in continental, mm-hmm. not continental North America, um, mm-hmm. more like Canada and the U.S., right? Because yeah, I guess yeah. Mexico has their own things going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you look at police brutality, for example... And the question is, well, what's better? Do you stand up against the institution um, or do you work with the institution, right? Yeah. And I feel like this is a question that Black people are still asking themselves, right? People of African descent are still trying to understand 
what's in our best interest here? Do we try to protect our history and do we try to protect, you know, these connections that we've lost and do we try to connect, you know, protect um, religion and, and all of these traditions, right? Or do we quote unquote modernize, right? And, you know, is it not better when you look at, um, you look at the African countries, you know, you see like the big fancy buildings that were, erected during uh, colonialized times versus everything that we were shown in the 90s, for sure. You know, the huts, the mud huts and whatnot. Right. And, you know, are counted as poverty and not counted Mm -hmm. as alternate ways of life, right? Where the land is respected and human life is honored. Yeah. And I don't think there is a correct answer for this Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, me speaking from a place of privilege, of uh, um, immense privilege, I have no no authority on the subject. But I think as somebody looking from the outside in, there is no one correct answer because there is there's no one correct answer in all of life, whether it's better to surrender or it's better to fight. So Mm -hmm. I think the best thing that we can do is just work together to get these stories out to help the community as much as we can and just be good human beings. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, um, it's interesting, you know, having the, the, the Brock and the Lingare and, you know, these kinds of systems that are set up because, back to the question of what's in our best interest, right? And yeah. you, you see how other cultures look at gender roles and uh, what's the, you know, what you should or shouldn't be doing, um, what you're allowed to say or not say, et cetera. But this, this uh, yeah. idea of having a, not, not deity, um, was a sovereign that's coming through the mother line and mm. then having like an elected, mm-hmm male ruler, you know, and this, this rulership in tandem, it, it makes us have to go back and start questioning, okay, fine. Well, this is where we are now, but what lessons can we take from mm. other cultures and what lessons can we yeah. take from these things that we're now discovering about how the roles can actually help us to progress? You know, I think after yeah hundreds of years of rulership, Somebody figured out something that might be worth listening to. Yeah. Right? 600 years. They were around. That's that's twice as long as America has been a country. So right. clearly, yeah. clearly they did something right. Yeah. <laughs> so unfortunately, the kingdom of Wallow did come to an end when, what year was it? Um, 55, was it? Yeah, 1855. Yeah. So the Wallow Kingdom officially became a colony of France in 1855. Date was dethroned, and that was the end of the Wallow Kingdom, but not the end of the Wallow people, who still live in Senegal today. They have an absolutely beautiful culture, a rich history. And I think there's something like, what, altogether, six million, I think, six million wallow in Senegal still today that carry the traditions, culture of a kingdom that lasted for over 600 years. Yes, yes. Because there's still, um, from what I understand from my friend, they still refer to one another based on the original um, tribe, right? So like she was telling me that her dad is from one tribe, really? her mom is from another tribe. They speak completely different languages from their separate tribes. Wow. And so that's still continued to this day, which is a really big point of pride. And it should be keeping those languages alive for that long, even after colonization is a feat in and of itself. So... Thank you so much for joining today, Nadia. This was an absolutely 
amazing conversation to have with you. I'm so thankful that you agreed to come on and help me tell this story. I really, really, really appreciate it. And for all of the history BFFs out there, would you care to tell us where else we can find you, other projects that you're doing, things like that to end this episode? Sure. Well, first of all, again, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so happy to be a part of the BFF tribe. Um, <laughs> you know? Yes. <laughs> it's another way to, to spell history buff, right? The history BFF. Yeah. Um, yeah, buff. Exactly. <laughs> and I really wish that we knew more, could find more. I mean, maybe one day this means we yeah. meet up in Senegal <laughs> so that we could go digging for a truth together. Oh, <laughs> don't even tempt me. I will meet you in Senegal as ASAP. <laughs> I will show up with my Indiana Jones hat and, and whip. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> I'll oh, buy God. some khaki shorts. I'm here. I'm here for it. <laughs> right. I just I just feel like it needs real exploration. You know, somebody has to give this some attention. Yes. So before I give you guys how to find me, yes. all of our history BFFs out there, if you find something, it like please help us figure out all the parts that we missed because we really want to know more. Yeah. Um yeah. So to find out where to find me, it's very simple. <laughs> Go to HeySisterHerStory.ca. That's www.HeySisterHerStory.ca. And all of our socials are there. And, you know, you can connect with us. Um, be sure if you know a woman who is a visionary woman, she has big dreams that make no sense. <laughs> Support her, please, you know, encourage <laughs> her and, you know, connect her with, you know, with the women who think like her, who are just as nuts, but also working really hard on bringing our visions to the world. So that's www.heysisterherstory.ca. And we will put that link in the show notes as well as all of the socials where you can find Nadia and her story 2114. So once again, Nadia, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an absolute delight and a pure pleasure to talk with you. And I will see you, my delicious little donut, in the outro. Well, dear one, thank you so much for tuning in to this very spur of the moment episode. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nadia as much as I did. She is such a fascinating human being and we had so much fun researching, putting these things together and just we had a great time. She is wonderful. Please go check out all of her things, all of her socials. Give her some love and don't forget to check out all of her things um, in the show notes below. So if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a rating or a review. We're still trying to get to that goal of 100 ratings and reviews by the end of the season. If you would like to spread the For the Love of History love... <laughs> Send this or any episode to your other history BFF because word of mouth and friend recommendations are the number one way that people find podcasts. If you'd like to look at the new season five merch and pick up some history BFF crew gear, <laughs> you can head to the link in the show notes to check out all of that fabulous merch so we can be twinsies. There is a discount code for free shipping and a discount code for 11% off to celebrate season five. But like always, absolutely no pressure. Your presence is enough support. I really appreciate you spending your time with Nadia and I today, and I can't wait to see you next week. So before we go, don't forget to drink your water, take care of yourself, do something that makes you happy, give yourself a hug from me to you, and I will see you next week when we start our Women's History Month series and talk about the true story of Hua Mulan. Okay, bye! 
why is there a metronome right now? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>